So welcome to our English worship this morning. Early last year, we began a new sermon series on the twelve minor prophets of the Old Testament. The title of the series is Minority Report. Notice the singular and not plural. This is because the twelve minor prophets are not just twelve individual prophetic books. Biblical scholars believe that they were carefully put together. After the Israelites returned from exile to form one unified volume, now this prophetic volume begins with Hosea and concludes with Malachi. It begins with Hosea chapter one verse two: "Go take to yourself a wife of Hordom," and then hundreds of years later, it closes with Malachi chapter one verse two. I have loved you, and I am still loving you. The book of the twelve is, in other words, God's prolonged love song for His rebellious people. But at the heart of this love song is not a unconditional love, so to speak. Whatever you do, I will still love you. I will still forgive you. No, in the heart of this love song is a persistent call. For repentance, repentance is a must. The people of God must turn and be saved. And that same love song continues to ring true today, from the old to the new, and from the new to the present day. God is calling us every week, every time the word of God is being preached, urging us to repent from our hearts, to return to the Lord for life, true life. Eternal life. Before and after Easter, we have reviewed the first ten prophets of the twelve. Today, we have come to the final two. We have come to Zechariah and Malachi. So we'll begin with Zechariah. If you were here two weeks ago, you may remember that Zechariah actually forms a pair of glory with. Haggai, the prophet preceding him, the central theme for Haggai is a house of glory. You know, God is going to build a house of glory, His temple, and the central theme of Zechariah is a king of glory. Zechariah tells us the story of this king of glory who would not only build for God the house of glory, but he will also rebuild God's holy city, Jerusalem, and he will remake the people of God into a people who is obedient from the heart. But it all began with the rebuilding of the temple. That was the shared mission of Zechariah and Malachi. So let me take you to the historical background, Ezra chapter five, verse one. Now the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Iddo, prophesied to the Jew who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of God of Israel, who was over them. I wonder if you still remember the historical backdrop, the, the backdrop story, and the timeline. So remember, after Solomon, the kingdom is, was divided into the north and the south because of idolatry. So the northern kingdom is called Israel. The southern kingdom is called Judah. But both kingdoms continue to worship other gods. So God brings judgment upon them in the year 722 before Christ. The northern kingdom of Israel was no more. You know, vanish because of invasion from Assyria. Then you are left with the southern kingdom of Judah. In the year six o five B.C., the first exile took place. There was the first batch of people being being taken to Babylon. And by the year five eighty six B.C., Judah was no more, vanished because of Babylon. So now, about seventy years after. The first exile to Babylon, God opened a way for the people to return to the land, to Jerusalem, to with one purpose in mind to rebuild the temple of God. That is the year 538 B.C. So they returned to Jerusalem with one single purpose, not to have a better life, but to rebuild the temple of God. Now, sadly, this rebuilding of the temple ceased. 
stop pause after two years in face of opposition from their enemies. Well, we understand that. We understand opposition. We understand the enemy. But it got paused for 16 long years. It is like even after the opposition vanished, they continue to pause the project. They began to work on their own houses while the house of God remained in ruin. So 18 years passed in the year 520 BC. Enough is enough. So God raised up Haggai and Zechariah to call the people to repentance. And they are to rebuild God's temple in Jerusalem. Now, if you look at these two prophetic books, you begin to realize how Zechariah's ministry and Haggai's ministry overlap with each other. You know, uh, there is something unique about these two books is they gave us the dating. They tell us exact date when these books were prophecy were written. So Haggai and Zechariah were like Batman and Robin. They were great partners in God's rebuilding project. So they, their prophecy began in the year 520 BC and then continued 519 BC and then 518 BC. But notice how at the bottom of it, we have come to Zechariah chapter 8. But Zechariah is not done. Zechariah still have chapter 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. We are at half point, the midpoint of Zechariah. Zechariah is one extraordinary book with two very different halves. The first half divided into three sections is noted for the precise dating of three prophecies. So Zechariah gave us three prophecies, and each one have a date on it. We know exactly when they were written. And then you have the second half. Without any temporal marker, we have no idea when it was written. And it's divided into two sections. And it's filled with prophecy concerning like a distant future. It is not something that will immediately happen, but something in the future. The theme of each section is as follows. Repent and return to God. And then there were eight visions in the night, from fasting to feasting. Behold the shepherd, king of glory. And finally, the Lord is king over all. Due to time constraint, we will only look at section two and four this Morning. Let me turn with you to the eight visions in the night. Now it's a very puzzling uh, piece, uh, like many chapters, uh, when you have eight visions in the night, and we have no idea what these are until you try to read the message as a whole. That means you cannot read them one by one. If you read them one by one, you got confused. But when you look at it as a whole, you begin to see that. Zechariah is actually giving us a chiastic structure in the form of A, B, C, B, 8. He constructs this chiastic structure out of the A vision. So what you see is on the outer layer, we find judgment against the nation. That's theme number one. So there are actually three themes, right? Theme number one, the outer layer, the nation will be judged. This whole world will be judged. Then in the middle section, C, we find there will be a priest, Joshua. He will be cleansed and purified. We also see another person, another figure by the name of Zerubbabel, and who is a descendant from King David. So it's a figure of a king. And this king will rebuild the temple. Now, notice this is a vision, so it's not something like really will happen to Joshua or Zerubbabel. It's like a dream. And the dream implied there is something in the future. There will be a holy priest. There will be a kingly figure that will rebuild a temple for God. And then we have the sections B. And the section Bs can be simplified to something like this. The holy city, Jerusalem, will be rebuilt. 
and the holy people of God will be remade. Now, if you are Jew and you remember the historical backdrop, you would know the city is in ruin. It has been after 70 years of exile. The people return to this and say, oh my God, look at our community. Everything is ruined. There is no city wall. This place is total, just like garbage. But God gave them a vision. God said that the holy city of Jerusalem will be rebuilt. But more than that, the people of God will be rebuilt. Because the people is the real problem. They have forgotten about the Lord. They were worshipping the idols, the false god of the land. But God promised that one day the people of God will be worshipping him and him alone. So we ask, who can accomplish such great work for the Lord? Who can rebuild the holy city? Who can remake the holy people of God? And the answer is C. There will be this holy priest and spirit-filled king. And this person will be the one that fulfilled this promise. And here we are not talking about two persons. It is not like we have another Batman and Robin situation. It's not a priest and a king, but the offices and functions and duties of a priest and a king in one person. So this person will be both a priest and a king. This person is God's chosen man for the job. Who is this person? Now, if you read throughout the entire Bible, you know who that person is. That person is Jesus Christ, the coming one. He will not come until 400, 500 years later, but he will come. And this is the prophetic vision left for us by Zechariah. Zechariah tell, wait for this guy to come. Wait for the holy priest and the spirit king to come. And when he comes, he will rebuild God's city for us. When he comes, he will remake God's people for us. So the eight visions in the night, they take us to the second half of Zechariah. Second half is, behold the glorious shepherd king of God. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, a very familiar verse that we all remember. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous. And having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. Now this passage is most familiar to us because we will read it almost every year, like Palm Sunday, right? And this word was quoted by both Matthew and John. But there is a twist here that remained untranslated in our English Bible. Biblical scholars tell us this that this Hebrew word for humble, righteous and having salvation is he humble and mounted on a donkey. This Hebrew word humble is actually more commonly translated as poor and afflicted. So the correct reading would be something like this. Look at, behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, poor and afflicted is he mounted on a donkey. So when you read it that way, naturally and rightfully, you begin to think about the suffering servant. So the king is riding on a donkey, but then the one who is riding on the donkey is also the suffering servant. This servant, this king, he would ride a donkey into the holy city of Jerusalem. And that was not an act of humility. Sometimes people say, you see, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. He is the king of humility. He is a humble king. No, 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 you got it wrong. The reason why Jesus chose a donkey over a horse is because he was the promised son of David. Why? Because who else rode on a donkey? Solomon. When Solomon was declared to be king, he did not ride on a horse. He rode on a donkey, the donkey of David. So Jesus picked the donkey because he wanted to tell people that his true identity is that he is a son of David. So the servant, this king, would come to fulfill the Davidic covenant 
to bring into this world this everlasting kingdom of God. Jesus came as the son of David. He came as the suffering servant to save the daughter of Zion. How would God save his people? Well, that takes us from the Old Testament into the New. And this is where we arrive in John chapter 12, verse 15. It is a quotation from Zechariah. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming on a donkey's coat. We have come to the fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy. And now look at your king. Behold your king. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been done to him. When Jesus was glorified, suddenly the disciples finally understood. Understood what? First, when Jesus was glorified, doesn't mean that when Jesus became king, he was given the award, the praise of the people. When he was glorified is another term when he was nailed to the cross. In the Gospel of John, glory means the cross. When Jesus, after Jesus was nailed to the cross, then his disciples suddenly remember. They remember all these prophecies in the Old Testament. They remember specifically the prophecy by Zechariah, that the things prophesied by Zechariah will be done to Jesus. It has been done to Jesus. What thing has been done to Jesus? Two things. If you are familiar with Zechariah, you remember two things. The first thing is Jesus, the good shepherd, was dismissed by the chief priest with 30 pieces of silver. He was dismissed by the priest for 30 pieces of silver to be sent to the cross. He was betrayed by 30 pieces of silver. That was prophecy number one. That was a second thing that was done to him. And the second thing is in John chapter 19, verse 37. And again, another scripture said, and that scripture is also from Zechariah. What Zechariah said is this, they will look upon him whom they have peace. That fulfills Zechariah's prophecy. The good shepherd of God was dismissed and then forsaken, nailed to the cross. They will look upon him, they have pierced him, to death. So the glorious king of heaven was afflicted with shame and beating. It was at this cross that God's salvation was accomplished for all returning and replanting, repenting flock of Zion. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Why? Because look at your king. Your king is not at the cross. Your king have come to save you by giving his own life for your sin. So let me sum up the book of Zechariah with my one minute homily. So this is what Zechariah is all about. Zechariah and Haggai are prophetic partners in rebuilding the temple, a house of glory and a king of glory. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. An extraordinary book of two halves Zechariah reveals eight night visions and a glorious shepherd king. Three three themes came out from the eight vision. Number one, judgment on the nations. Number two, a holy city rebuilt. Number three, the holy people of God will be remade. Who could accomplish such great works? Only one person, the shepherd king. He is the holy priest and the spirit king, two in one. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, Jesus is coming, sitting on a donkey's coat. Then they look upon the king crucified, whom they have pierced. His disciples did not understand these things at first. Then they remembered that these things had been written about him in Zechariah. So they repented and believe in the only one true God. Let me summarize and apply Zechariah for you with three points. This is what the book of Zechariah is about. Number one, the house of glory and the king of glory, holy city and holy people of God. 
Point number two, a vision of the night, chosen king, and a good shepherd. Number three, glory at the cross, glorify at the cross, nail to the cross. The Lord, one and only Savior that we have. So once again, Zechariah is a book that calls us to U-turn and face the only Savior we have. That takes us to the final book of the Old Testament, the final book of the prophetic 12, uh, 12 minor prophets. The book is Malachi. Now, as I have repeatedly emphasized, Malachi echoes the first book. The first book is Hosea. They form a pair of inclusio to the book of the Twelve. The first prophet of the Twelve is Hosea. The last book of the Twelve is Malachi. The first book say, go marry a wife of Hordom. And then the end say, I am still loving you. It is a call for God's rebellious people to you turn and be saved. Now, if you remember that Malachi's prophecy came around the 100th anniversary of Israel's return from exile. Well, so time has fly, and they have now been back to the land for a hundred years. That should be a point, a time of great celebration. And God marked that special occasion in time with a special declaration of love. What did God say in that occasion? God said, I love you. I have loved you. And I am still loving you despite the fact that you remain rebellious. And God said, please come back, return to me. You turn and be saved. Ironically, it is this statement of love that leads to six rounds of pushback from the people of God. So what do you get in Malachi? You get six rounds of pushback, six rounds of disputation of God's people against God. And the sixth round of pushback goes something like this. They ask God, how have you loved us? How have we polluted you? How have we profaned you? How have we wearied you? How have we robbed you? How have we spoken against you. Now we can divide these six disputations into three groups of two. Within each group, we find a statement of doubt, and then an evil and wicked deed. So effectively, they are using their so-called doubt to justify their violence breaking of the covenant with God. So it goes something like this. The yellow one is the doubt, and the red one is the evil deed. So it begins something like this. It is in vain to serve the Lord. He has not given us any benefit. It is in vain to serve the Lord. So what should we do as an application? Since it is in vain to serve the Lord, let us rob him. Let us rob him of his tithe and offering. So we know that one of the problems, one of the chief problems is they refuse to tithe. They refuse to give 10% of their income to the Lord. And they feel like they're justified because they have tested God and God has not given them any benefits. So since God is not so good to us, let us rob him of his tithe. Now some of us have to think about this. You know, we are modern people and we live in a world uh, where we feel that income is always tight. Now when you don't make too much, you think tithing is a lot. When you make a lot, you think tithing is a lot. So no matter if we are left or right, you say tithing is a lot. And we don't tithe. Then what did the Bible say to us? You are robbing me. You are robbing me. You are violating my covenant with you. That's one. And then the second thought they have is God has not executed justice. God has let the evil people run away. So what's the implication of that? The implication is, if he had let the evil people run away, he has not executed justice, then this God does not deserve our exclusive worship. So what does it mean? It means that we can worship other gods. It means that we can go marry the daughters of other gods. We can divorce our wife and go marry someone else and worship their God as well. And then you have the first set. 
they said in their heart, the Lord has not loved us. He has not loved us. Since he has not loved us, then it is okay for us to sacrifice the blind and the lame and the sick animal to him. And we keep the best to ourselves. They justify because if he had loved us more, we will do, we'll give him the best. But since he has not done that, God is not a good God. He has not given us the best. So we justify ourselves not giving him the best. So once again, the three great evil deeds of the Israelites are, number one, refusing to tithe. Number two, divorcing and marrying women of different gods. Number three, the priest, the spiritual leader, abusing their power, sacrificing the blind, the lame, and the sick instead of the unblemished animal and the best produce of the three years. So if you read it through the eyes of modern men, then their transgressions and sins are about money, sex, and power, right? So they love their money. They refuse to give God the 10% that God deserved to have. And they love many wives, so they go divorcing their own wife and marrying someone else. And then they abuse the power, the priest, as giving God the sacrifice of the blind, the sick, and the lame. So that's through the eyes of the modern people. But through the eyes of the Old Testament, their crimes are violation of the Ten Commandments, which is our new sermon series beginning next week. They have violated the Decalogue. They have violated the Ten Commandments of God. They have violated the Eighth Commandment, the Seventh Commandment, and the Fifth Commandment. What was the Eighth Commandment? The Eighth Commandment, you shall not steal. What did they do? They robbed God. They not only they are stealing from God, they are robbing God, uh, you know, by refusing to tithe. And then they violated the Seventh Commandment. What is the Seventh Commandment? You shall not commit adultery. And they committed adultery over and over again and divorcing their wife and marrying new wives. And then they violated the fifth commandment. What was the fifth commandment? Honor your father and your mother. That takes us to Malachi chapter 1 verse 6. Malachi chapter 1 verse 6. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame and sick, is that not evil? It is here that we begin to realize the severity of Israel's rebellion. They are breaking God's covenant violently. You see, in the Old Testament, there are three covenantal relationships depicted in God's gracious covenant with his people. Within God's covenant, there are three forms of relationship. Relationship number one, God is the loving father to Israel, the son. And Israel is to live as a God-honoring son in return, right? If God is the good father, what should you do? You should honor God as your father. How do you honor God as your father? You give him the best. You give him the best produce of the land. You give him the best animal sacrifice. And when we don't give God the best, we're not honoring him as our father. And then the second relationship, God, is the loving husband to Israel, the wife. How is Israel supposed to live in response to that? Israel is to live as God's faithful wife in return. How do you live as God's faithful wife in return? Being exclusive in the worship of Yahweh. There shall be no other God. And then being faithful in your own marriages. And that is how you remain faithful to Yahweh as a wife. And then there is a third relationship. God is the loving master to Israel, the servant, the grateful servant. So Israel is supposed to live as God's grateful servant in return. How do you live as God's grateful servant? You joyfully giving God the tithes. When you give God the tithes and offering, you don't give it just grudgingly, you give it joyfully. That's how you become God's grateful servant. So notice how in 
the short span of four chapters. The book of Malachi only have four chapters, four chapters, 55 verses of Malachi. The people of God collected three strikes and a red card from the Lord. They have violated all three covenantal relationships. Yahweh should be furious. Yahweh is a holy God, a jealous God. He could have, he should have set a fire on them and let them disappear from the face of this earth. But he did not. How did Yahweh respond to the rebellion? Well, he responded by sending them more prophets, sending them more prophets, giving them more chance to call them to repentance. Oh, Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way. This is about a future. And despite the rebellion, God said, I will send you one more. I will send you another messenger, singular. This one is special. In Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord. Malachi chapter 3, 1 tells us God is sending us a messenger. And then when we got to Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, the identity of the messenger is revealed to be Elijah, I'm not just sending you another guy. I'm sending you the best of the best. I'm sending you Elijah. Now, Elijah, of course, is one of the most well-known prophets of the Old Testament. What do you remember Elijah for? And some people say, well, did he do a lot of miracles? Yes, he did. But he was not known to be a prophet of miracles. He is known to be a prophet who stands firm against idols, idolatry. False God, that's what he is about. And God will send them Elijah, who will take them to make a stand against the idols and false God of this world. And of course, if you remember the story of Elijah, you remember that Elijah had that rare privilege of being taken up into heaven without going through death. So there are a lot of speculation now. Will, will re Elijah come out of retirement? Will Elijah come back as his an old man and do more? Or will God send another person that looked like Elijah, that would do the things of Elijah? That's the question when you close out the Old Testament and waiting for the new to be unveiled. Malachi chapter 4, verse 6. What will Elijah do? When he comes, he will turn the heart of the father to the children and the heart of the children to the father lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. The core ministry of Elijah is to turn the heart, is to call the people to U-turn. You see, you have to U-turn. If you don't U-turn, what will happen to you? Utter destruction. This is the message. It's not that the love of God doesn't mean that you will be saved no matter what. The love of God means that He gives you time and chances to repent. And unless you repent, you will enter into utter destruction. And so God gave us this gigantic prophecy at the end of Old Testament. There will be a Elijah. There will be this messenger. And that prophecy took us through 400 years of silence. You know, there's this 400 year without a prophet from the old into the new. And 400 years later, when we open up the New Testament, Luke chapter 1, verse 13, and you shall call his name John, verse 17, and he will go before him in spirit and power of Elijah. So we now know John is the new Elijah. This man has come, he has come as the first prophet in over 400 years. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. John will be the prophet of the Most High. You will prepare his way to give knowledge of salvation in the forgiveness of the sin. So this prophet of the Most High, this first prophet in 400 years. But look, he was nevertheless limited to the preparation work. He's not a chef. He's just a little guy in the kitchen cutting things for the chef. He is just the preparer of salvation. He is not salvation. Salvation will come to God's people, not through John. 
that salvation will come to God's people through another person, a far greater person, the chosen promised king of the Lord. Who is he? Well, I want to take you back to the final verses of Malachi to the end of Old Testament again. As it turns out, there's still another prophecy hidden in these verses. These are the final verses of your English Old Testament Bible. Malachi chapter 4, verse 4. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at horror for all Israel. Then verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So the law of Moses and prophet Elijah. Here, Moses and Elijah join hands to close out the Old Testament. They join hands also to point us forward to the dawning of the new, you see. So at the end of the Old Testament, who do you find? Well, where, where, what, what do you see? You see Moses and Elijah joining hands. And then they take us into the new. And very interesting, when you open up the New Testament, it doesn't take long before you encounter Moses and Elijah again, this time high up in the mountain in another divine drama, Luke chapter 9, verse 28. Remember that story? Jesus went up to pray. And as Jesus was praying, appearance of his face was altered, and his clothes become dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with Jesus. The two men were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke about Jesus' departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now, this story was commonly known as Jesus' transfiguration, right? You know, it's our famous, uh, our favorite Sunday school story. We'll have some special effect with some lighting, Jesus' transfiguration. But a more insightful title of the story should be Jesus' upcoming departure in Jerusalem. It's almost like he was going to Jerusalem, and Jerusalem has an airport, have an air shuttle station that will take him back to heaven. Jerusalem is the place of departure for Jesus. But very interesting here, the Greek word translated as departure is actually exodus. Exodus. So what will happen in Jerusalem? Jesus will accomplish exodus. This is a reference to the Old Testament story of Exodus. Moses and Elijah were talking with Jesus about what? About Exodus, about a new Exodus, about the fulfillment of the old Exodus. The old is a shadow, the new is the reality. Exodus is what Jesus has come for. He has come to deliver God's people, not from Egypt, not from physical slavery, but from spiritual slavery, from the house of idols, from our deep bondage to sin. So Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, you, will remember, you may remember this verse. She, Mary, will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Not from your financial trouble, not from your difficulty in life, not from your illnesses, but she will bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus. Jesus means God saves. God will save. God is salvation, and he will save his people from their sins, not from your illness, not from your financial difficulty, but from your sin. How would Jesus deliver us? From our guilt and shame and from the power and bondage to sin. How will Jesus save us? Now remember what happened in the story of Exodus. Back then, God delivered Israel through a bloody pass over land. And God will do it again. This time, the real deal. Uh, it was just a prop in the beginning, in the old. But this time, it is his son. His son will become for us the Passover lamb. His son, his very own son, will become for us the lamb of God who will take away the sin of the world. So Jesus nailed to the cross. 
He is the perfect Lamb of God, the atoning sacrifice for our sin. This is what Moses and Elijah were talking about. This is what the Old Testament, as it closes in the end, is all about. Looking forward to what Moses and Elijah will be talking to Jesus about. The law and the prophet prophesize about Jesus coming and his accomplishing exodus in Jerusalem. So let me summarize Malachi for you in one minute. This is what Malachi, or the Minority Report of the Twelve Prophets, is all about. The the Minority Report of the Twelve is a prolonged love song from God to his rebellious people, calling them to wholehearted repentance. Hosea began with, Go take to yourself a wife of Hodom. And hundreds of years later, Malachi echoed with, I have loved you. That prompted six heated disputations and three evil deeds from Israel. Blind, lame, sick for sacrifice. Union with wives of other gods. And finally, a refusal to tithe to the Lord. Israel was a rebellious son an unfaithful wife, an ungrateful servant, all at once. Still, God sent them Elijah. God sent them the prophet John the Baptist to turn their heart and to promise them of salvation. High on the mountain, Moses and Elijah spoke of a new exodus by Jesus. On the cross, Jesus became the Lamb of God, taking away the sin of this world, taking us all the way to the wedding of the Lamb. So what should we do in response to this? Let us repent, return, and worship the Lamb. Let me summarize and apply Malachi one last time with three points. I have loved you. Six reviews and three wicked acts. How should we respond to this? Sin no more. Let's turn from that three wicked acts. Let's give God the best. Let's honor God in our worship. Let's give Him the tithe. Point number two, rebellious and unfaithful. But God sent them John. God sent them prophets. And then in the New Testament, God sent us Paul, Paul said, God sent us Peter, God sent us John to turn our heart to salvation. Salvation comes when Moses and Elijah talk about Exodus with Jesus. Salvation come and accomplish on the cross to tell us that we will all be saved by the blood of the Lamb. What should we do? We should turn, repent, and watch the Lamb. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we are thankful for this long series on minor prophets, an area of the Bible that we find it both difficult to teach in little kids Sunday school as well as in grown-up Sunday school. We find it difficult to understand, and we find it even more difficult, perhaps, to apply. And that's why we have so skillfully avoided those sections. But here we are, coming face to face with your prophets, 12 of them, testifying to one unified theme, you turn and be safe. I have loved you with an everlasting love. That's the verse we like to put on the top of our desk. But we forgot to experience that love. To dwell in that love require a U-turn. U-turn and be safe. And so we pray this morning that all of us here will hear you, your call to turn and repent and be safe. 
and help us to remember that this is not just a message from the old Old Testament. It is the same message that was proclaimed to us in the new. Be it Paul or Peter or John, they preach the same gospel. They preach repentance because they are following Jesus, who preached repentance himself. Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. So I pray this morning. I pray for everyone who is here. I pray for everyone who was at the memorial service yesterday, that they will hear your call, return, and be saved. Thank you, Jesus, for being the Lamb of God that will that have taken away the sin of this world. May we watch you and follow you all the days of our life. We pray all that in the name of Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.